I'd rather have the option to experience more, contribute more to my community, learn more new things. And so I deliberately seek delaying death as a way of living. My name is Ben Charland. You're listening to What on Earth is Going On. My guest this week is Colin Fairley, Queen's University Professor of Political Studies. Now, Colin is a philosopher. He's a political philosopher. And we start our conversation on his current focus of research, which is the philosophy of aging or the science of longevity. What does it mean for our societies and what does it mean for us as individuals that we are pushing death later and later, that we are postponing the inevitable, and perhaps that we are building a world in which we become practically and virtually immortal. It's a really fascinating conversation, really fascinating questions, but we do broaden the scope of this. We talk about philosophy as the love of wisdom. We talk about the value and the meaning of death and why it matters that humanity as a whole flourishes. We talk about the anti-science movement that we seem to be seeing today, Donald Trump, the Enlightenment Project, and democracy as a social experiment. We even talk in the end about gamification and the biology of play, the celebration, the importance of play in our day-to-day lives. Now, if you like this conversation, please give this podcast a review and a rating on Apple Podcasts or on whatever podcast app that you use. You can also do the same on Facebook. You can go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.com for all previous episodes and for a way to get in touch with me to let me know what you think of this episode, this conversation, or any other. You can also find on that website the show notes for every episode. Finally, the best thing you can do if you like this show is to spread the word. Let your friends know on social media or by good old-fashioned word of mouth. And let me know what on earth you think is going on. Okay, Colin Fairley, welcome to the program. Yeah, thanks for having me, Ben. It's so great to have you. I'm really excited to chat with you. Um, We met because you host a philosophy group here in Kingston. And uh, that's not necessarily what we're going to talk about here, but we can. But it was really interesting to, to understand philosophy for me in the basis of what philosophy is, which is conversation, dialogue, dialectic. Before we get to the big question, why is philosophy important to you? Yeah, uh, it's a great question. Philosophy for me means the ancient Greek definition of love of wisdom. I think it's a way of life, uh, having intellectual humility, always be questioning things, mulling over what kind of life should I live, what kind of society should we have. So I think it's critical both for developing as a human being, avoiding big mistakes in life, but also as a society, it can help foster healthy governance, avoid intolerance, uh, promote equality and inclusion and justice. So I think it's both important for individuals and society as a whole. Yeah, in my research for this episode, um, you do a lot of work on the ideal and the non-ideal. And I don't want to say applied philosophy, because in my mind, all philosophy is applied. All philosophy is trying to answer pretty basic human questions. But your work has, well, you know, in the, in the broad scale has focused a lot on how does this really matter today? How is this really going to affect our lives? And the central question, as you've said, is how should we live? Um, do you feel that, that philosophy has helped you live your life personally or does it feel like work to you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's both. I think, I think actually, uh, so it is work. It does require a lot of reflection and rumination, which can take into extremes, can, you know, uh, perhaps not be so such a good thing. But um, for me as an individual and in the career I've chosen, I love reading, I love thinking, uh, learning new things. So it's been an integral part of my own identity, uh, something that I try to foster throughout my life. And yeah, taking philosophy into meetup groups in the pub, uh, as well as the prisons. Um, so I'm, I'm really interested in, in pushing philosophy outside of academia to try to tackle these practical issues that you mentioned. There's a, a line from your website, and I'm trying to find it here. It's about how your goal has been to bring uh, the ideals of the Enlightenment into the 21st century. But I'm trying to find the specific line. because <laughs> Oh, here we go. The fi- foundational aspiration, the advancement of Enlightenment project, of the Enlightenment project into the 21st century. What do you mean by that? Yeah, so I think we live in fascinating times. I think the early 21st century is an amazing uh, time to be alive. Uh, but the advances of science, democracy, 
um, can't be taken for granted. I think there's a time for renewal in our aspirations about what kind of societies we want to create, where do we want the future of humanity to go, the world of reason, optimism. It's very easy to be pessimistic about the future. Uh, so I try to counter that with a kind of data-driven understanding of like where we've come from, where we might be going. Uh, not pie you know, optimism, the kind of reality-based optimism. Uh, but I think that enlightenment uh, it is critical for moving forward uh, rather than just kind of going back to our default setting, which is kind of blinders on, just focusing on short-term gains and this is the big picture about, you know, really long-term, what are we trying to achieve? Yeah, you did a, a TED Talk here in Kingston in April of 2019, um, which was about aging and uh, global aging and longevity science, which was fascinating because when I started to watch it, I thought you were going to talk about the demographic deficit and talk about how we're all screwed. <laughs> because one of the first statistics you bring up is that by 2050, tw 2 billion people will be over the age of 60 in 2050 and 3 billion by 2100. And I thought you were going to say, okay, we're screwed. <laughs> we need to find a way to kill off a bunch of us or something yeah. along those yeah. lines, a pessimistic approach. And I was really struck how in the 15 or so minutes of your TED Talk, it was actually quite optimistic. And also a, a clarion call to say, we need to cure, well, not just cure diseases. We need to provide for longevity. We need to harness science and innovation to make our lives longer and better. And that was not what I expected. And so I think you do provide a bit of that antidote to the pessimism we seem to be facing today. So on that note, I have to ask the big question to start us off, Colin. What on earth is going on? Yeah, that's a great question. And uh, because there's so many things going on, I like a step back big picture. For me, it is the aging of uh, humanity, which is the biggest uh, story of what's going on in the 21st century. Life expectancy of birth of 72. So we've made incredible gains in reducing early and midlife mortality for humanity. But we also will face challenges of chronic diseases in late life. So the World Health Organization has identified 2020 to 2030 as the decade of healthy aging. And I think that really is a, a laudable aspiration. How can we promote health in late life for populations? And I think it will require some innovative thinking about how we approach the medical sciences. And it will raise a whole quandary of predicaments about populations living longer and the, the good things and not so good things about doing that. Well, in ethics too, because a lot of this comes down to genetics. Um, you know, the, the longevity for a human being and the period at which they are frail which is often quite short. Um, but for a person that's going to live a long time, say to 110, the time in which they're frail is actually quite short. Um, they're pretty healthy up to maybe 107. Um, but it's all, if it's all coming down to, to genetics, then when we talk about science and innovation, are we talking about interfering at that level? Yes, I think uh, we kind of face a choice. One, one uh, option is to pursue what we're already doing, which is to focus on delaying death by trying to cure each specific disease of aging. That kind of takes our biology as, as a given and then works through managing multimorbidity to try to delay death. But a consequence of that is we could be extending the period of time people are living with disability and frailty and uh, multi multimorbidity. Another strategy is to go after the evolutionary causation of these things, actually change the biology, the way that we age. And as you point out, some human beings naturally have a slower rate of aging. It's strongly genetic. Um, and I think that, that field of science, known as geral science, will prove to be the most critical for a public health advancement that actually extends the human health span. So why, I mean, I can understand why this is important because it sounds good to me, because I want to live a long time. Why is it important for all of us? If we talk about philosophy as all of us together, how should we live and not just I live? Why is this important, especially when we're face to face with climate change as somewhat of a result of overpopulation? Yes. Yeah, so there's lots of problems. I mean, if we think that disease and death is a problem, then aging obviously is going to be on the radar because uh, most, uh, most of these chronic conditions that are killing human beings occur in late life. Uh, so cancer, f for example, killed approximately 10 million people last year. Um, now, if we just continue going after each of these diseases, which I agree is, is a morally laudable aspiration, I don't think we're going to cure any of them. Uh, and there is, there is a danger that we'll sp spend more and more money 
just to keep people managing multimorbidity. Well, and it's like whack-a-mole. Like multimorbidity means if you solve one thing, another yeah, one will come right. and get you. That's right. So eliminating all cancers, for example, would only increase life expectancy by approximately three years. So tackling uh, aging itself, and it is critical to give the details of what that actually means. If we're actually keeping people healthier longer by delaying and compressing morbidity, I think that's a very different thing. The reason it matters is because uh, for the first time in human history, the greatest threats to human health are not actually extrinsic risks, though there are lots of uh, severe extrinsic risks. They're By that you mean external, like yeah, things that's that are right. like Infectious falling disease, in, in, conflict, right. poverty, which is lack of, of food. Uh, now it's in conjunction with the limitations of our biology itself. We're living long enough that the inborn aging process itself is making us vulnerable. Even in rich developed countries, most people that are dying and suffering frailty and disease are people over the age of 70. Uh, and so what can we do to promote the health of those people uh, in late life? So most children in the world will live long enough to suffer these chronic conditions. So I think there is a, a, a kind of universal perspective that you can take. It's not just a problem for me or for Canadian society. Uh, in particular, China and India, for example, lower middle income countries, uh, aging populations are much more vulnerable to uh, the challenges of late life when they don't have the universal health care and the pension system that we have. So their interest in remaining healthy as they age is linked to their financial security, uh, sustainability of their family, um, so I think when you get down to the details of why aging is important and mitigating the disadvantages of aging, it's a story of economic development. It also has a gender component uh, in terms of who's taking care of aging parents. Um, and it just has this humanitarian component of trying to prevent suffering. Chronic disease is progressive, slow, painful. Um, and if we can do things to delay and shrink that, that would matter a lot in terms of just like uh, improving the life prospects of humans in the 21st century. I'm trying to remember the thinker who divided um, human history into three stages. Essentially, they said there was the age of destruction, the age of disease, and now the age of decay. In other words, they were saying for most of human history, say 199,000 or 195,000 of the 200,000 years of human history, if we're going to say it's that long, was the age of destruction. Most of the causes of death were brutal. Um, you're going to fall and, and break your leg and not be able to cure it. You're going to just get a cut get it infected, or you were going to die in infant, infant mortality, which was so common. Uh, and then, of course, once we had civilization, quote unquote, uh, or the agricultural and then the industrial revolution, we had the age of disease. And all of us together were essentially passing on all these diseases, which were a destructive force unto themselves. And now we seem to be living in the age of decay, when the main cause of death is the natural course of life leading out to its full term. But I know, like, the reason I ask this is because I know that that's an oversimplification. But I know, I know also you've done some research on creatures that seem to, like the, the, the naked mole rat, which seems to fly right in the face of this. A, a creature that is almost immune to cancer, has a lifespan six times the, the length of a, of a mouse, and holds the keys, perhaps, to not just longevity, but, I mean, perhaps if we can figure it out, all sort of immortality. This is something that Yuval, Yuval Noah Harari has talked about in Homo Deus, one of his newer books. Um, but, yeah, what do you make of that? Yeah, so the, the I mean, I, mean the, I completely agree that the role of civilization in helping us escape a world where life was nasty, brutish, and short, as Hobbes described it, um, but the, the kind of paradox of that is that the aging of the human population is artificial in the sense that civilization has created protective environments where humans can live uh, long enough to then die from cancer, heart disease, and stroke. Um, the species, so we have an evolutionary history. It's implicated in why we age it the way we do. The naked mole rat, uh, bowhead whale, other species that have exceptional longevity um, understanding the, the, the kind of biological puzzle of how some species can live exceptionally long um, and the role of specific genetic mutations that uh, play a factor in their remaining healthy so long might open up another key for civilization to tackle. I mean, if I had to pick one thing in the 20th century, it was smallpox, killed about 500 million people. It's the only disease to be eradicated since 1980. I'd like the story for the 20th century to be one, I think it's both feasible and morally desirable that we slow down the rate of aging. Uh, not exactly sure how much we'll be able to do that, but if we slow down the rate of aging to delay the onset of these conditions, 
it would be the biggest public health advance in the 20th century, comparable to sanitation revolution or uh, uh, eliminating smallpox, uh, simply by the sheer number of human beings that are living that long, and as we were saying before, all the diseases that will come in. So if we, even if we make headway on just prostate cancer, then you have bowel cancer and lung cancer, um, you know, all the other 200 plus types of cancers that come in. Whereas if we could, if we could delay those things by activating the longevity genes that confer more resistance to make our bodies and our minds healthier, uh, I think this would be you know, a huge step forward in terms of uh, improving the life prospects of human populations living this century. I'm going to lob at you a big philosophical baseball and ask you, what about immortality? So if we delay all of these th things until we become virtually immortal, or some of us become virtually immortal, um, where death is so far away, it's not even worth considering. Is that a laudable goal? Is that, is that, I mean, let's talk about this in terms of philosophy. Would we still be human if we didn't have death over our heads? Yeah, no, it's a, it's, I think it's a great philosophical question. I, 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 so I'd preface by saying I don't think it's going to be scientifically feasible to become a, immortal, maybe biologically immortal, meaning we don't die from aging, but we die from you know, getting hit by a bus or right. uh, slipping in the, in, the, in the bathtub. But if we could, um, I, I, I think uh, it does raise profound questions about what, I mean, obviously we wouldn't be human beings anymore. We'd be godlike if... if, if death was not even something that could happen. And the brain that we've evolved to possess is focusing on kind of short-term goals. It's hard enough to get 20-year-olds to worry about retirement and saving you know, money for the 40 years in the future. Imagine people that capable of living hundreds or, of years or thousands of years. Or voting or practicing politics in the long term either. Yeah, but That's yeah. diced up into small short-term thinking. Romantic too. relationships, friendships, career choices, um, so I think philosophically, it's a, it's a great debate to have where we could talk about, you know, would we get bored uh, or maybe we continue to grow and develop? I mean, it's just, it, you know, for some people that are curious, perhaps, you know, they travel all around, learn different languages. Um, whether well, or not, what's, like, what's your instinct? If you had a red pill and a blue pill in front of you and one of them was immortality, would you want it? Um, it's a great question. For me, it would, there would have to be, I'd need more details about if it's just me. Uh, right. And all the people I love and care about are not. Uh, uh, so that would be to live an infinite life having lost. Although you could, you know, you will have new people uh, that you fall in love with or uh, uh, new friends. But uh, my biological children, right. uh, that, that, so uh, it would be, a, that would be the kind of question I, I probably would have to ponder more as a, because it's not actually a real option for me. I, right. But I, my hunch is, if the way you frame it is you say, well, when would you like death to come to you? I think the rational answer for most human beings with the proviso we're healthy is, well, delay it as far as possible. Right. I'd rather have the option to experience more, contribute more to my community, learn more new things. And so I deliberately seek delaying death as a way of living. Uh, right. not obsessing about it, but I, you know, wear my seatbelt, don't text when I'm driving. Sure. Uh, so if that's what the pill is saying, it's, it's, it's just going to, uh, forestall, um, but it would be even more effective by just eliminating it. Um, I, I think it's a hard case for saying that the immortality camp is a preposterous choice. It's really interesting because the way you just described a potential immortality of forestalling and delaying death, you know, just inevitably, but, but also continually always pushing it off seems to be what we do anyways. Seems mm -hmm. we live our lives, whether they're, we live our lives in fear of death or we just are always postponing it and trying to be healthy, but also trying to make choices so that we live where the clean air is or things like that. We're already doing that. And there's many books and plays written about this. In other words, it's the human condition to be forestalling this inevitable thing. But the fact that we might not want to stop it and prevent it entirely is very interesting. Mm -hmm. Why would we want to continue, continually delay something we're not willing to stop altogether? Or may not be willing to. Well, that's right. And I actually think it's part of our cognitive dissonance when we're asked with that question of, would you, you know, would you like to be immortal? Because we know it's not a real option. We can find compelling reasons. That, well, no, I wouldn't really want it. I'd be so bored, right? And you could, uh, but yeah. that's not a real option. If it were literally were an option where you, you know, it's offered, would you like your family to have aliens come? It's a one-off. Here, we're going to offer this to you. And 
I, again, it, it might not be uh, an intuitive go-to answer. Yes, I'd take it. But I think when you weigh up the reasons for and against, uh, yeah, there's lots that you could unpack and get into about, you know, why do we value the time and opportunity that we already have? And would that just continue, uh, you know, continue? You could just continuously uh, learn, love, uh, travel, uh, interact with people. But if we're talking about a future where, yeah, humanity's gone, the, uh, the planet is demolished, but you still continue on. You're floating around. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I've got a free-floating well, consciousness. It might start to sound like... Uh, that's hell. That yeah, sounds like hell right. to me. That sounds like eternal <laughs> damnation. It's just to be floating around in nothingness, but still being aware that you're floating around in nothingness. There's, um, I think what we fear, in a way, is infinity. We, f we fear this infinite loop or this infinite kind of boredom but the thing is, what, what the, the irony here, for me anyways, is that if there isn't a limit on the life that I'm living, then is the life that I'm living as sacred and as valuable? And like, would I do this right now yeah. if I knew there was a limit? Or would I just sit down and do nothing? Or just like stare into the sky or watch another YouTube video? Yeah. I mean, the fact that death is haunting me forces me to live a more fruitful life and perhaps a happier one, although maybe that's debatable. Well, so, so I, I preface, because I agree with you on that. I preface, when I was 20, uh, I didn't, I really did feel like I was immortal, right? 20 right. year olds kind of go through life. Uh, yeah, yeah, I could die, but I'm not so worried about it. I took a lot of risks, um, but I was having fun while I was doing that, right? So there, there was a kind of a, a period of my life where my mortality didn't factor into my life like it does now as I'm approaching 50, where I, uh, the finiteness of my life is very vivid. Uh, you know, I've had a father pass uh, last year, so I'm, I'm aware of my mortality and the cohort of friends and family that I have and what's going to be happening to them. So that does amplify up my interest in facilitating certain things. I think ultimately the question is we want like, the, the, the role of the flourishing life. We want to flourish. That's what I want, you know, humanity to flourish as a species. Uh, the, the mortality, immortality component, I think, while it's a great philosophical debate, I don't think it's as integral to that question. Uh, you can flourish, we do flourish, we can flourish as mortal beings, and as you're saying, it does add meaning, purpose. It can, it can add that, but the devil's in the detail. Uh, and that's why I think when we talk about the onset of chronic diseases, it is something that actually does pose a major challenge to this narrative of trying to create opportunities for humans to flourish it's, uh, as, as populations are aging, assuming there's something that we might be able to do to minimize and delay the onset of those chronic conditions, I would tell the narrative of human flourishing, but it wouldn't, it wouldn't be one about the immortality component. Can I ask another big philosophical softball question? Why? Why is it important that humanity flourishes? I understand why it's important that I flourish or that <laughs> you feel you should flourish, yeah. but, but why is it important that the wider species or civilization or whatever it is flourish if it may have no or any or just a marginal impact on me or you? Yeah, it's uh, so I think it, it really does depend, I guess, on what our moral ideals are. And, uh, well, I wouldn't want to say the moral landscape is exhausted by just focusing on human beings. I am partial to human beings, uh, you know, my, my children, my compatriots, people in other countries. Uh, so I, I, I do think we're all collectively in this as a species, as you were mentioning, 200, 300,000 years, and we've overcome these huge obstacles. Uh, we still have a lot of work to, to do, to try to create a more just, fair, and equitable world. Uh, there's big challenges coming. Perhaps we're going to, you know, t t one step forward, two steps back kind of thing. But if we, if we abandon that... If we just say, well, yeah, uh, e you know, it's all about egoism, right. or uh, then I don't or think any... Or, or nihilism, I don't really yeah. care, whatever Yeah, happens, that's right, so matter. nobody will flourish. Right. I, mean, I mean, under those circumstances, um, so, you know, we have this, this gift opportunity to, to uh, we're actually alive, we're sentient, um, and I think this question of, because we can author to some degree the kind of lives that we have, which is unique about human beings and our capacity for reasoning and uh but we can also make huge mistakes um and so yeah I, I mean against the egoism or the nihilism uh i say of the options of having some kind of meaning and purpose <laughs> the least bad <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> and not only that i think it actually is uh morally defensible i think there is an obligation 
uh, on us, uh, not necessarily a kind of utilitarian, de super demanding where you sure. give up your whole life. Um, but we each kind of make f find our, our place in that calling in different ways, whether it be through uh, volunteerism, parenthood, uh, just being a nice person, uh, educating, uh, trying to enhance the dialogue. Right? This podcast is doing that's giving people something to think about and reflect. I mean, those those are the grassroots thing that I think help humanity kind of correct uh, its tendency to kind of uh, go down to, to dark places and intolerance and ignorance, which, yeah, will take us kind of back to the Hobbesian situation if we're not careful. I think also that it's fun and interesting to try to make things better. I mean, yes, there's a destructive tendency too. I remember when I was a kid playing video games, it was nice and fun to blow up the city and destroy everything <laughs> that you've created. But there was a sense behind that you, that you'd saved your city before and like in, into a file, I mean, like saved the game. So you could always go back to it when it was nice and pretty. So there is a destructive tendency, but it's more fun and more fulfilling in the long term to build something, to contribute. And I just think it's not as boring as being all out for myself or not caring about what happens at all. That just seems boring in the same way that it's boring to float in the universe for infinity with nothing to attach to yeah. and just being aware of this eternal damnation. But there's another question in here too, which I always struggle with, which is the difference between our species and our civilization. That we've built a civilization that some people might criticize, but is quite wonderful in what it's provided. I mean, the fact that we can sit in this room, speak electronically into a box, which collects this and distributes this, distributes this to, I don't know, a dozen people or a billion, who knows. Yeah. Um, but we're sitting in a room that is prevented, that is protected from the weather. We know what the weather is going to be. I mean, the running water, electricity, there's so many things that civilization has granted to us that granted is based on our species. But if you were to tell me that our civilization were to come to an end, that would be horrifying to me. But if our civilization were to come to an end and the species were to go on, I don't think I'd care. I care more, what I'm trying to say is, is I care more about the civilization and what we've built. The species is, if another species took on our civilization or we evolved to something else, I don't know if I would care so much. But some people have said to me, no, it's, it's humanity. There's some fire in us. There's something deeper that's important to protect. And I wonder if, if that is even maybe a false distinction Hmm. that I'm bringing up or what you make of it. Yeah, so, so I, I, I value both. I value both civilization and, and the abstract, devoid of any specific people, but I also do care about our species uh, because I do, I do see us as, uh, so we have a history, all right? So uh, we could talk about the history of political thought and the ideas that have helped bring us here. Um, and, and there's a kind of a stewardship. We, we now are the living. Um, what we do will determine what will happen for those that don't yet exist, but do in the future. They will include, you know, uh, children, Greek and children. Um, so th I, s I see humanity, this is kind of continuity uh, and a stewardship um, component. While the specific people in the abstract, you might, well, you don't know who's going to be around in 500 years, but assuming there's going to be somebody, they're going to be like you and I. Mm -hmm. uh, in, I mean, it is different if we talk about some kind of transformative scientific innovation that, you know, yeah, humans are gone, some transhuman, uh, uh, post-human species comes into existence. Uh, there may be a scenario one could describe where people voluntarily shift away from being homo sapiens to something else. Like download but, their consciousness yeah, to something else. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, yeah. there could be ways in which you, you could tell that story which wouldn't sound tragic. Uh, but uh, what I'm envisioning, I'm envisioning kind of involuntary, whether an asteroid or climate change or an infectious disease that wipes out humanity. Um, to me, that would be uh, a, a huge loss because in a, in a universe that um, has uh, very few sentient uh, conscious creatures, uh, despite the downsides of humanity, I am an optimist and... Uh, so I think there's, you know, you can tell an important story of the difference between being an optimist and a pessimist. I mean, you have a little bit of both, but ultimately, if we're optimistic about things, we're a little bit more uh, willing to try to shape things to make them better. Uh, if we're too pessimistic, then we just, you know, what, why bother? There's no hope. Uh, and when you lose that hope, is a kind of a downward trajectory where it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Even for an individual, if you go through life ruminating about things you cannot control, and yeah, we're all going to die. So if you just 
fixate on that, uh, it, you know, you're, you're going to end up uh, with depression. Uh, whereas if you focus on those things that you do have some control over and you can tell a narrative about purpose and meaning in your contribution, I think it's both the reality that you actually can improve, uh, you can make a, a difference in people's lives, um, and also it's a good narrative to tell yourself because your life will go better when you see yourself as an agent that does have an impact on, on people's lives, even though it, in the big picture of things, right, we're just a little flick. Right, right. Well, speaking of agency, I mean, we live in a world where there are 7 billion people, right? And I think that, sure, I have the platform of this podcast, and you certainly have the platform of your academic work. So we feel whether it's true or not, that we have some agency in the story that you were just talking about and some agency in contributing to the human experience or the human condition as a whole, whether as a country or as a whole species or just in this community where we are now. But whether or not it's true, I think most people feel like that agency is much more limited. And maybe we're just as limited as they are, but they feel like their part in that story is very, very small. Mm -hmm. And I'm not asking you the typical question like, well, how can people feel like they're contributing better to society? I mean, I, I don't know if there's a satisfactory answer to that question. But, but if you feel that you don't have the agency that we're talking about, then what... I mean, beyond how should I live my life, how do we make the leap from how should I live to how should we live mm -hmm. if I don't feel like I have that platform or agency? Yeah, so that, that agency, I wouldn't want to make it a too lofty uh, an aspiration. It, I, for me, it would be the little things about um, how you relate to other human beings. Um, so we're not necessarily talking about, you know, you, you have to actually be a transformative game changer in some right. kind of, you know, uh, Bill Gates thing where you make a, a innovation technolo technological change that, um, but those, those little things about the impact you have on the people around you, uh, and how you live your life with purpose and meaning, uh, some humility, forgiveness, creativity versus, intolerance, uh, you know, sticking your head in the sand, never asking questions or excluding people, never challenging. Uh, so I think it's really those things. How do, how do we function in the family? How do we function in the workplace? Um, and then you could get into more lofty things like talking about, you know, citizenship and how you talk about politics and, and, and contribute uh, to the political process. But for me, it would... It, it's omnipresent. It's it's about the kind of human being that we are, and it doesn't require uh, access to uh, in, uh, technology that could possibly meet lots of people. It starts with, you know, being a, a good friend to somebody, being a good partner, um, and contributing to your community, uh, and that kind of that kind of uh, moral aspiration or ideal is having certain character character traits, so kind of virtue ethics uh, way of understanding it. It does get a little bit more lofty if we get into kind of epistemic virtues and moral virtues, but um, I wouldn't want it to be an elitist ideal mm. that only, uh, you know, a privileged few could could get at because that's not really the bread and butter of what makes humanity work. It's actually right. our day-to-day -day interactions and the kind of people we are. But sometimes it feels like that. Sometimes you read the, you read the narrative that we're talking about and it feels like, for example, when, you, when I read history when I was a kid, essentially it was learning about what king ruled when, yeah. what they did at that time. There was no social history that I could find or that I was exposed to. And so if history is to be understood as the rule of these kings until you had presidents and then parliaments and all of this stuff, oh, okay, I can be maybe a part of that if I'm, if I'm I guess, powerful enough in this lifetime, but I'll never be a king. Um, so it seems so far removed, and yet I think that you're right. If we, if we understand our species and our civilization is much more foundational than that, much more about the interrelationships of millions and millions of people, but it's not written that way. Mm -hmm. So then are we talking then about not a revision of our history, but a, maybe a, a refocusing of it or looking at it through a different lens? Yeah, that's right. It's, a, I think, a tendency when we look back in history, we focus on elites, big events. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's a reality that if, if nobody reproduced, there would have been any future generations, right? So, so just reproduction itself is, is something, unless you're doing evolutionary biology or you're studying the history of women and, and gender, uh, it would be something that would, would come to, you know, just uh, how, how cultures 
the role of patriarchy and evolution of patriarchy, uh, public health measures, things as you know innocuous as uh, you know the sanitation revolution, immunizations. It's these small these small things that really uh, have the biggest. I mean, there are big things: you know, agricultural revolution, industrialization, uh, and now you know, you know artificial intelligence, other things. This century, so it's a combination of those. I think you need both. You do want to have the kind of social history to understand uh, the role of those things are, are hugely important. And then you do need, there are big game changers that come along that have great transformative potential. And we want to be aware of those because I think this century there will be a couple of big ones like that. Uh, and uh, if we haven't learned from the past, like public health measures, for example, we're already seeing people turn against vaccinations mm. and, and an increase. In the, and that in part is because we, we've become apathetic or anti-science about it. And it's like, well, if we just went back a century or two, we, we'd have a lot more gratitude and support for these kinds of public health measures because we kind of take them for granted. Right. The paradox, once it becomes reasonably safe, we let our guard down and then we, we can quickly revert back to that. One thing that Colin has brought up so far, and I think it's a very interesting idea, is epistemic virtues. Now, this is similar to the idea of being a critical thinker. In other words, the virtue of thinking critically. It's a very important concept for philosophy and for this conversation. Now, coming up in this episode, Colin asks another really important and powerful question. How do we make advancements, not just in the scientific or the technological or the political realm, but the moral realm? All that's coming up on this episode of What on Earth is Going On. This, this anti-vaxxing thing or the anti-science movement or whatever we're talking about, I mean, just to arrest that for a moment, why is that happening? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it's a, it's a, I mean, science is complex and complicated. And, uh, you know, so as we were talking about uh, elites and the average person, so yeah, there, to, to, to get a handle on the science and the data it does require uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, comprehensive understanding of the science in medicine. And so there's a question of how much, how much people trust authority. Um, right. And in our ability to confuse reliable authority, so the internet in a way amplifies this, you can just do a Google search and you can find anybody who has a blog that makes some disparaging causal connection about mm -hmm. uh, versus a you know a peer reviewed something in the New England yeah, Journal of Medicine. Yeah, it puts them on the same level. Yeah, it's like, well, I've level. read, I've read, and this, per oh, th when they described what happened, that made sense to me. And, and so there is this part of it is trust, part of it is the complexity. Um, and, you know, I mean, it is a sad reflection of our culture, I mean, where people are becoming skeptical of public health agencies, recommendations, um, and, and gravitating towards things that have some intuitive traction. So I think part of it is the way the human brain works and our susceptibility to various biases, uh, in addition to uh, the distrust we might have about elites um, and a kind of a disdain for science in general. So I think it's, it's linked with those broader cultural uh, a mix of uh, the, the kind of our evolved brain architecture and a cultural uh, environment that perhaps for some individuals will fuel that kind of, you know, make a name for yourself by challenging medical authority. Right? Sure. It's well, and if you extrapolate that problem to, say, political polarization, which in our time seems to be pretty intense, Right. Uh, looking at the United States, for example, in the presidency of Donald Trump, I mean, the, the numbers of support versus the numbers in, uh, not in favor of his presidency and the numbers for and against impeachment are in lock. They're locked in. And that means that the people who believe in him are going to stay believing in him, and the opposite is also true. And that there's no movement anymore. Mm -hmm. Now, w this is an old conversation. I know when we've talked about there once was a time when you had moderate Republicans and, and red Democrats and things like that in the States, and of course in other countries too, you had more of a soft middle that seemed to be governing things in the post-Second World War consensus, so to speak. And I don't want to belabor this point, but if we, if we talk about it as a bigger crisis, I mean, this seems to be a kind of the boogeyman of today, something that is reducing our ability to make things happen because we can't agree on a common story. That narrative that we're talking about seems to be fragmented and fragmented because we don't agree on it anymore. We don't agree on 
the basic things that are happening. And even if we, we dispute reality, something as basic as a vaccine that seems to be as, as evidenced as possible, as empirical as it could possibly be, with no real science against it, it's still dividing people. It still makes it impossible to get over that conversation. Climate change is another one. It seems this to me to, to be a massive obstacle that all the things we're talking about, if we're going to be optimistic about the future, we have to overcome this in order yeah. to do so. And I just, I put it to you, well, what do we do? And, and is there a way to, to frame this philosophically to gain a better handle on it? Yeah, so I think uh, disagreement is a, it, it's going to be a persistent, and it's, it, it, it's not a bad thing. It's a good, mm. like, to some degree, you want to have disagreement because that's a way, I mean, for, for some issues, there just will be disagreement, both about the, so we can have disagreement about the facts, uh, and there, there could be nuances. So, if you know, disagreement sure. about, in, within epidemiology, about, uh, you know, the role of eating meat in our, our risk of cancer, for example. There'll, there'll be different studies that, uh, have different views and nuance and you want the science to kind of resolve that with more data, more evidence. Uh, then there's going to be disagreement about the, the values. That's going to be, so you have disagreement about the empirical reality you have disagreement about the, 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 the moral evaluation. Um, and so when you go into the political realm, for example, and you get a mishmash of both of these things, so you have some people when it comes to yeah, cl uh, climate change, there might be disputes about the facts, but there also might be uh, moral evaluative disagreements where people talk about the difference, you know, how much moral discounting do you do about helping people that might live 100 years from now versus people living now, uh, and who should bear the cost of this in developed right. countries. Uh, so you, you get all these things. So I think there's no way around... Uh, the disagreement, um, but at the same time, we are making advances in uh, the scientific fields that are actually coming up with the facts. Uh, the, the, the trickier part will be um, how do we make advancements in the moral realm? Um, uh, so we, we have a combination of these two things, um, and I don't think there's any way around that other than um, to continue the kind of enlightenment project of challenging unfounded assumptions, right. um, having some intellectual humility ourselves, trying to empathize and understand, you know, why does this person have, have this view? Like, uh, maybe I'm missing something. Maybe actually I'm the, I'm the ignorant person in this. Uh, uh, but at the same time, the courage to challenge them when they, when they, you know, aren't uh, predicating their position on something that's defensible. But yeah, it becomes so partisan. I mean, uh, what's going on in the United States right now is a great example of that. Uh, and so really, I think you, you, when you have that disagreement entrenched, usually you defer to some procedural component. But this is what we're seeing like contested in uh, the possible impeachment of Trump now is what's going to happen with how the, the procedural will play out. Right. The procedure the is in question. So like you said, there's a disagreement over facts. There's a disagreement over values. But now there's a disagreement over the procedure. And by procedure, I mean large scale democracy. We could talk about the procedure in terms of the way we elect leaders and the way that we institutions are, are governed and govern us. Those are the procedures that we disagree on, so if we disagree over everything. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I would say, too, is that maybe this crisis that we seem to be in, this intellectual crisis or whatever it is, could be that the, if I disagree over morals, that changes my understanding of the facts. That may allow me to actually see different facts than I would see otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of research done on the, the idea that my moral position changes which facts I see. Yeah. Yeah. And and not doesn't and they, they may even change the facts themselves. So I believe something different about what this reality is than what you believe, simply because our value is different. So to, to they're no longer in these separate categories. They're they're mixed and mingled, and th that's why I take your point really strongly. That maybe the solution here is to advance our moral. Um, capacity to, to advance ourselves in terms of our values and not just in terms of, I mean, I, I don't disagree that we need to challenge false assumptions, that we need to focus on the empirical side of it, but there also needs to be advancement on the other side too. Yeah. And I mean, one of my favorite philosophers, John Dewey, uh, 20th century American democratic theorist. So he characterized democracy as a social experiment. And I think that's, so this is an experiment that's been going on just over a century in a kind of m mature level but it's well, it's it's still ongoing, and there's always corrections. We you know we think we're making progress, and then we realize um, 
And as an optimist, I, I still think uh, if we're committed to this experiment of finding a way to collectively live together that's nonviolent and inclusive and deliberative, um, that that it, that in the in the end the pros will outweigh the cons. But there will be moments of crisis and reflection and dysfunction uh, that might actually be a catalyst for a renewal. Uh, just as you know, you, c you come up against the anti-vaxxers and, and, and pushing back against public health measures, even within a democracy. I mean, we complain a lot about the politicians and that, but but the citizenry and the debates and the press and the social media, all those things are components of that too. Um, and so, unless we actually uh, are committed to this, again, it's kind of laudable aspiration of having reflective moral agents who have these conversations around the dinner table. T uh, town hall meetings, um, workplace, uh, you know, water coolers, whatever, <laughs> if, if anybody does that anymore. Um, th those things are going to be integral where it's, yeah, both a confrontation of the empirical understanding and the normative. So that moral debate, and this is why I think philosophy is critical because philosophy is doing that. Like, what is the good life? What are my duties as a citizen or as, as a human being? Um, and it might not be about getting the answer, but at least in asking the question, we might avoid, yeah, those kind of cognitive biases we have where we're prone to make unwise decisions because there's some short-term gain or self-interested reason that's really there. And until we're aware of them, uh, we'll just continue to make the same, same kind of mistakes. Just going back to the premise of that, though, you said that if we're committed to making this work and it live in a society with nonviolence and peace, working together collaboratively for better outcomes... Um, well, what if that is what's in question? What if people are not committed to that premise? What if people are saying, I don't buy this anymore. I want, I want to go out for me. I want to just use whatever I can, my money, my guns, my mind, whatever I can do to make as much money and power and protection for me and me alone. Because I don't trust that system anymore. Yeah. If there's so much mistrust for, the, for that premise and therefore disbelief in that premise, then what do we do? So for example, if you and I in the room believe in this, but a lot of other people don't, what do we do about those people who don't even buy into the premise of this democracy, yeah. this social experiment? That's right. And there certainly could be, I mean, as dysfunctional as things might appear right now, especially in the U.S. politics, civil war hasn't, um, uh, hasn't come to that. So, but as you mentioned guns, you could also talk about incarceration, the... Uh, what, what's going on in terms of you know incarcerating people in such high numbers? Um, so there's elements, of course, that uh, contravene the kind of idealized account of the social experiment as deliberation, debate, discussion. Um, and so we do need uh, of you know kind of a, maybe acts of civil disobedience uh, to raise awareness of causes that are not. So I wouldn't. I, but there's a difference between that versus like actual political aspirations to overturn the system and to have some non-democratic uh, way of life. As dysfunctional as things are, I don't think we're at this this point of a kind of a tipping point of where it actually will re, you know, go down into some kind of uh, civil war, people out in the streets trying to overthrow. Right. But we can't take that for granted, right? It, no. it, it, this, and this is why it's so important. The Constitution is there to pre-commit us to certain ideals and principles. So when people start pushing it aside, the danger of that is it opens the door to, yeah, tyranny. Or but, but this is kind of the, the big democratic question that we're, we're grappling with is what if a lot of people want to push it aside? Yeah, yeah. In fact, what if 51% of people don't want democracy, yeah. right? I mean, that, that seems like an ironic question that seems impossible, but a lot of statistics show that a growing number of young people would favor, for example, a military dictatorship, that they would be in favor of that over with the current system because they think it would get things done because they seem to face a system that they don't trust, that gets nothing done, that is in the service of the elites. And so what do we do, Those, if it's 49%, which is not the case right now, but what if it was 49% of us that thought we want democracy over the 51% that said we don't? Yes, that's, it's, it's true that if the people don't want democracy... Uh, no constitutional checks, no separation of uh, powers will work. The people have to want... Now, whether or not uh, people's cynicism about the current state of affairs um, goes so deep that they would actually 
Uh, so this would be like a counterfactual test. If we kind of like sure. a Hobbesian thought experiment, we say, well, uh, he was he was making that argument for an absolute monarchy, but let's just say our our, our democracy or whatever's going to replace it, and that that might include dissolving into a kind of an anarchy situation where the peace, yeah, peace is actually not not the the, the go to yeah. status quo. Um, but I think there's a difference between complaining about what politicians are doing in political parties and maybe having apathy, just not voting, not turning out, versus organizing to actually create. Uh, so I would say uh, as dysfunctional as things, that that is not, uh, my impression is that we're not, we're not seeing that. Uh, right. And, I don't, democracy and I, I don't think we're seeing that in, on along the lines that you described, but what if you have a huge number of people mistrusting the system? It only takes a handful to come in, like Lenin, for example, in yeah. the in 1917 with the overthrow of the Russian uh, of the Russian Tsars of the Russian monarchy that had been going on for hundreds of years. A lot of people had lost trust and faith in that system of government, and it only took one small cabal, one group yeah. of guys, to get together and say, "We're starting something new," and they created the Soviet Union and modern communism. That's right. So the one big difference I'd say there is the affluence that the average person lives uh, lives by in developed uh, uh, democracies is such. So unlike the Bolshevik Revolution, where um, survival, getting uh, material needs met in an agricultural mm. society. So as much as people complain, so yeah, if you read Twitter and social media, it might sound you know, like there's a lot of disgruntled people, but the reality is that the system in terms of delivering peace and material prosperity, despite the inequality that's there is unprecedented in human, in human history. It's, if the revolution is going to come, it would be from democracies that are not actually delivering on peace and material you know, survival. Uh, so I, I, I think it would be really surprising and, and kind of irrational if people overturned a system despite its dysfunction was actually delivering, unless there's a huge economic crisis that get and you know in 2008 there was a worry that perhaps uh, it doesn't seem you know th th things have seemed to uh, have improved not equally for everybody, but not yet at a like for the French Revolution for example or the Bolshevik Revolution. But of course, if it came to that, you kind of have a Marxist lens. Right. I mean, this is what Marx believed, that that's what would happen. There, The boom and bust of the capitalist sure. economy would get to a stage and the class consciousness would raise. Uh, if that happens, if capitalism doesn't actually pass that kind of threshold for keeping stability together, then yes, I think that, that the people would be, because the choice there would be starve to death or revolt, in which case revolting is rational and kind of, something you couldn't hold back. Well, there, there are some who say that the vote for Donald Trump in 2016 was exactly that, was exactly in, in, lacking in any economic crisis. In fact, the economy was doing very well in 2016, and unemployment continued to decline, and yet people voted for a candidate who essentially wanted to destroy the system. Now, I, I'm not saying that he wanted to eliminate democracy or cancel the Constitution, and he hasn't done anything like that or even said so, or although he's hinted at it many, many times, yeah. probably just for provocative effect. But that there was a sense of, of a destructive tendency in the vote for Donald Trump There's a, and for Brexit in the, in the United yeah. Kingdom in 2016 in the same year that just screw it. I just want it. I want this. I want this out. I just want to vote the bums out. And it wasn't a vote to endorse the system. It was saying, I don't trust it anymore and I don't care. Burn it to the ground. Now, obviously... We're putting thoughts into the minds of tens of millions of voters in both countries. But there seems to be this feeling of, I don't trust this anymore. Mm -hmm. And I agree that, uh, I think you framed this somewhat like this, that democracy only works because we believe in it. That, that this system of government only works because we, we decide that it works. It's not just there unless we live it. It's kind of like... Uh, it's kind of like a ghost. A ghost is only real because you believe that it's real, right? Yeah. It doesn't actually exist in any real quantifiable way. Anyways, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, with the Trump election, I, I, I mean, you know, one could talk about uh, what what role, what the Democrats were offering was a factor. The, the trust, uh, so it might have been pitched at a particular political leader or political party versus the actual Democrats. Because if you were against the democracy as a whole, you wouldn't even vote, right? You would just go, yeah. to the, go to the streets. So, I mean, there's this kind of paradox where, uh, but, but democracy allows that. Do democracy allows populist conservative parties 
that can pander if there's enough support. And so it's compatible with, it's the anti-democracy component would be when there's violations of constitutional rights, the electoral. So that's kind of the crisis we're now seeing in the U.S. with, with possible impeachment of Trump. That, that, that's the issue about that. But prior to that impeachment process, um, you know, and as somebody who's not a Trump supporter, but it's, it's, that's the way democracy works. You, 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 you can get extreme left and right. Uh, in the U.K., yeah, again, I would say mostly people were not happy with what labor was offering and it was a kind of a failure and that's yeah get things done because they've been hanging around for a couple of years in this brexit situation but not against the uh, while they might want it out of the european union not uh, out of the democratic uh, system itself so i think democracy is uh like when we step back and we look it's it's still the only game in town, really. As, right. uh, as Winston as, Churchill said, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. So, but but again, we, we can say that and still say we have a lot of work to do if we want to improve things and not have things dissolve into some kind of situation. Well, and I think you could also say that democracy is a huge box that you could fit many things into. I mean, yes, there's liberal democracy as we have it today, but a, a populist would say that democracy is the rule of the fifty-one percent the rule of the majority at the discretion of the majority, and we'll change the constitution if we want to, and if it affects minority rights, then whatever. That, yeah. that is a form of democracy. Yeah. De Athenian democracy had no enfranchisement of women or the slaves that were living at that time, yet we still consider it, in a way, a democracy. Democracy isn't just the, the allowance of all people to participate in all decisions, and in fact, that's not possible. But I also wanted to mention that there's... In, like as we talked about before, there are intrinsic as well as ex extrinsic threats to this. There's the intrinsic stuff that we're talking about, but there's also the other social experiment going on in China, yeah. which is not a democracy on, along the terms that we're talking about, but it does provide and has provided peace and prosperity and jobs and security for a billion people. And the more well that system does in comparison to the system we're living in, well, the more attractive it's going to look to mm. a lot of people. And... In a way, democracy doesn't need to fail. It just needs to look crappy against the alternative. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So it's a complex story then about the role of capitalism in, in this mix, right? So mm -hmm. capitalism in both democratic and non-democratic. And uh, yeah, China, I agree. Like this, this, this century, uh, both China and India will be major. Uh, they already are. Um, and I, I still don't see this... Uh, as necessarily conflicting with the story of democracy, but it's a complex. Uh, some some uh, the Western liberal democracies arose there out of industrialization, making that uh, China's path will be different. But I still I think that push for democratization uh, is hard hard to to resist, and, and I'm not saying you could delay going that way, but it, it's 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 a kind of a a complex, a complex case where you see the market playing a huge part, but also violations of human rights. And, and, and what will happen, and I'm not an expert in, in Chinese politics, but it would be fascinating to watch this century to see what happens uh, in, in China with respect to those issues. Yeah, and I, I think that's something we haven't dug into enough is not just China, but capitalism, which you brought up several times. But but the, the consequences of capitalism, too, that democracy is in a way how a democracy is meant to deal with in, in, in the context of a liberal democracy, that there's this inequality. And so we're going to create the system of government to somewhat mitigate it, but not eliminate it and make capitalism digestible for the masses. You could you could argue that that's what democracy is meant to be in the liberal democracy tradition. And we are now facing a, a crisis in terms of inequality that it's at the greatest, um, where I, I can't remember the statistics off by hand, but the, the inequality between people in North America and the Western world is so out of whack and, and closer to what it was like before the Great Depression that are we coming towards some kind of correction? Mm -hmm. And again, is China doing better to prepare for that than Western countries? Yeah, so on the economic inequality, I mean, if we preface... The difference between, so before the Great Depression, if we're talking about absolute poverty um, versus relative inequality. Yeah. So in Canadian society, 
we're all out of absolute poverty in the extreme. Uh, you know, if you talk about the countries in the world that have the lowest life expectancy, that but the the relative inequality. Right. Uh, so I do. I think like it shifts. It shifts the focus. The stakes are much different when we're talking about uh, the extreme uh, vulnerability of of living on a dollar a day kind of uh, situation. But but yeah, that because that has an impact on who gets what health care. Uh, I mean, Canada at least has some measures in place for trying to minimize the political influence. The United States, for example, yeah, running for president requires hundreds of millions of dollars. Like you, you got to have a lot of so that uh, that leaks into the political process. Um, the, the, the yeah, the story about I, I guess my view my view on capitalism. Uh, so for me, my biggest concern would be not so much for the inequality. I think there's an obsession with like gross, you know, just growing the economy, which historically made sense when we were in poverty. But now we're getting to a to a stage where that fixation on that has come at a cost of the quality of life. Like, so I think a shift from that economic growth mindset to a happy life or a meaningful life for the population so that people are not working so much, not consuming mm-hmm. so much, uh, but actually have better relationships, more meaning in their life. Right. So I think, and I think that capitalism tapped into some evolutionary instincts too. Yeah. This is a survival acquire things was I- essential. Uh, and it, and it played a purpose and now it's kind of, it, it's ex- expired its purpose but we're continuing in a pathological way, right? We're still fixating on it. So my next bo- uh, kind of major book project is articulating a vision of a realistic utopia that's focused around the idea of the playful life, the playful society. And my kind of, my hook for the book, the main thing is to shift away from this consumption growth mentality to physical, social, imaginative play throughout the lifespan. I think we'd have healthier, happier people with a better democratic culture than the one that capitalism is currently delivering. It's not to say we'd give up, but actually we'd be more productive if we probably had more play in our lives, better relationships, a sense of purpose, uh, and, and this kind of optimism and, and looking beyond yourself. So there's something about play behavior which is programmed into our our evolution and it is transcending when, when you're engaged in play you're not fixating just like i want to be happy with it. you're actually uh depending on the type of play but if it's imaginative play where you're you're, you're you're engaged in some kind of creative activity with other people you're bonding with them and you're empathetically interconnected and so i think tapping in to the playful nature and, and behavior is a way of bringing out these kinds of moral and epistemic virtues that, that I think are so central for flourishing. That's really cool. And I, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because that seems to me to be a way out of the crisis that we're in is to focus. And, and it is, it also seems to be a replacement for this pathological need to acquire more and to constantly focus on growth, which our governments are entirely focused on. I don't think, I can't think of a single government announcement or, or day in the life of a prime minister that isn't talking in some way about improving the lives of Canadians or Americans or whatever and growing the economy and, and creating jobs for people. The, the language is so in lock with that. Um, but you also mentioned play, which is also something happening with gamification and the, the abundance of gaming technology and the abundance of understanding of what this does and how attractive this is to us Mm -hmm. and how much more easily we learn when we're playing and engaging with somebody creatively. And again, to go back to uh, Yuval Noah Harari, who who talked about how the great uh, revolution in the cognitive sense for humanity was this ability to share an imaginary space that no other animal can do this, to share intentionality and to share an imagination. Um, so that sounds like a really interesting, yeah, Colin, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a great conversation. Yeah. Thanks, Ben. My pleasure for five years. Uh, so I've been doing mostly research on the biology of play. Why, uh, why, what is play? So it's very contested in play literature. What is play? And then why we play. But I mean, it's linked just to link up a earlier theme we were talking about before about, um, how lofty our moral ideals are. This idea of a playful society, I think, amplifies these small interactions and dispositions we have. And so, so for me, this utopian society does not require a huge transformative, you know, it, it would be a culture shift, 
But yeah, celebrating play and seeing, because play is usually just seen as like, what a waste of time, right? You're playing, it's the opposite of work, right? So usually kids, oh yeah, kids are playing, but adults, we, we work. We do serious things like parenting and making money. Uh, well, I would say except for the most successful of us yeah. who play, and that is their work. Yeah, that's right. They know they play hard and work hard. Right? So. No, but I mean like the great artists of our time or the great entrepreneurs, the ones who are on the front lines of things, for them, work is play. They're, they're inventing. Yeah. They're creating. Yeah, they're, they're immersed in the activity yeah. and they find it intrinsically rewarding. Even if they weren't making money, they, they continue would do it doing it. Yeah. And, and so, uh, so I, that, that kind of playful utopian society for me, it would be a story about uh, who we are as a species and also uh, the smaller, smaller thing is something that's feasible. I don't think it's a, you know, it's not, we're not talking about over, overthrowing capitalism or anything <laughs> like that. But, but this small cultural shift, a consciousness away from making money and consuming stuff to doing certain things and being a certain kind of human being that honors our playful nature. Because, yeah, to suppress that, to the opposite of playful is depression, right? It's not seriousness. If you if you are shut down, and the kind of research, uh, 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 some play researchers looks at various serial killers and psychopaths that uh, there's a kind of a history of play deprivation early in life. Hmm. And so when you lose that ability, because it is critical for empathy and other uh, parts of our moral development, um, when you lose that, you shift towards a, a kind of a mindset that, you know, it's not good for anybody. So th it comes at a cost if we, and it, that's the extreme end, but, uh, less extreme would just be, yeah. So not engaging in physical exercise, for example, is coming at a cost to your health, but even in personal relationships, uh, when people, people see things purely in this strategic seriousness. Yeah. I don't know, who wants to meet a friend that's all just, well, what does this friendship bring to me? Right. we've got to be serious or romantic, Transactional. Yeah, yeah. Ro romantic relationships. Right. So, I mean, part of it is kind of spontaneous, live in the moment, not, you know, maybe it develops into something more serious, becomes a future partner. Maybe it doesn't. Uh, that's how you learn and grow as a human being. And but there's many parts of our culture, you know, from capitalism to online dating that, uh, you know, has, has shifted the way human beings interact with each other. And so I think this narrative of play could like shed a light on, on many parts of this from childhood through to, to retirement. I, I find this both fascinating, but also very attractive. It sounds appealing to me. It sounds like, oh, I could do that. I could live in a world that was focused on play. More play. I, <laughs> I, I love playing board games, for example. Yeah. I, I find doing this podcast a playful activity. It is work, but, but I do it for the fun of it. Um, but there's also, there's a part of me that's thinking here, okay, and maybe this is our, our last uh, tangent before we close <laughs> off, which is that you talk about this in terms of a utopia. I think there's also a potential of a dystopia here too. And the reason I mention this is because um, there's a lot of talk today about um, uh, virtual reality, augmented reality. And if we just built ourselves, kind of like we're building right now through social media, just another world to live in. Yeah. Most people who are young today spend so much of their time on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Snapchat, whatever it is, that that's their world. That's their social reality. That's where they're doing learning. Here in Ontario, the, the new um, government program to essentially have high school students do part of their education online, this is a growing part of what your reality is. It can definitely be based a lot on play, especially with the amount that kids are playing our video games on their computers and on their tablets and phones. Yeah. This could be an entire world focused on play where economic growth is completely put to the <laughs> side. For example, the elites might live in this world or they could live in that world or whatever. But we could be so distracted from the reality that you and I are living in now that this reality could go to, to shit yeah, while this yeah. other reality becomes wonderful and playful because that's the real, that's the real growth area for play, I would say. And I, I guess I'm just pitching that back yeah, to you. And, yeah. yeah, yeah, that's right. So I have three sons, two are teenagers. They all play video games. It's all so I, I'm well aware of of that <laughs> uh, that component. I think it's a question of so the the play based uh, kind of perfectionist uh, utopian argument I want to develop. Uh, it it is about balance and it's about proportionality because. Uh, I mean, part of the attraction for the online might just be, yeah, like people are checking out of real life, right? There's, I don't meet people in real life that have anything in common with me or everyone's on their phone. And so it's this self-fulfilling prophecy where, you know, they all end up virtually. Uh, uh, but that comes out of cost of physical play, right? So if you're just playing video games all day, you're not out playing soccer, you're not out riding your bike. Um, and imagine, so, so I, it's a mix because I think there's a lot of great things that can come out of this uh, 
you know, when I see my kids playing, he's, sure. he's playing with kids in Russia and he's learning. All. Well, what so, a great way to learn, right? Yeah, yeah. that's right. Like, cause it, for me, it was just the kids on my street. There was like 10 kids on the street I grew up in and we only play with each other. Uh, he plays with people all around the world, but he's sitting, you know, with his headset on, on his, <laughs> on his, his thing. And I, I, I'll, I'll encouraging him, do you want to go outside and like, you know, ride your bike and go meet? Uh, so sounds so, so boring. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's, yeah. So it would be a mix of physical, social, imaginative play. Uh, but anything taken to an extreme, it, there's a trade off involved, right? Yeah. So it, even if somebody's like physical play to such an extent that they destroy their, their, joints and limbs right because they've been doing this risk-taking thing same thing yeah Yeah, so you want to flourish and play to the extent that it helps you flourish in these different capacities uh is something to be celebrated but there you're right in excess or the absence right now i'd say we're at the risk of the absence and what the risk you brought up is a particular excess where it comes at a cost of the actual physical interaction and balance in life. And that definitely, I mean, there's now debate about classifying video game as an addiction, similar to smoking and and other types Mm -hmm. of addictions. And so when it becomes maladaptive, we do have this play instinct, but taken to an extreme, yeah, it can come at a cost of living a good life and would be something. Well, and of course, what if we just stumble into it? What if it's not a planned... What if it's not a planned process? We just find ourselves living in this world that is entirely virtual and all of our science is devoted to making our bodies survive doing nothing. Right, and and which goes hand in hand with your work on longevity. <laughs> but really, right. it's. It, I mean, I, we could have talked about this for an hour, and maybe we will get back together again in the future, um, and and talk about this really fascinating subject that, um, whether we like it or not, I think is in our future somehow. I think this idea of play is is uh, is in the cards for us. Yeah, Colin, thank you so much for taking the time. This has been a great conversation. Yeah, thanks, Ben. My pleasure. To learn more about Colin Fairley, go to the website, whatonearthisgoingon.ca. There you can find all previous episodes, as well as a way to get in touch with me on social media or by email. You can also find the notes for this episode and the references that were made throughout the conversation. Now, your quote of the week is from Yuval Noah Harari and his book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. Questions you cannot answer are usually far better for you than answers you cannot question. Thanks, as always, to our composer, Andrea Wettstein, for the music, and special thanks for this episode to Colin Fairley and the Department of Political Studies at Queen's University. Next up, we're talking about the power of names with psychoanalyst Mavis Himes. I'll see you then. Music